Okay, excellent. Uh, so just to pick up where we left off, uh, Sivutai asked me to add some um, some connectivity data. Uh, so here, just starting like with an image. This is all rabies tracing data. Uh, if you want, if you, you don't know what rabies tracing is, basically the rabies virus uh, jumps monosynaptically uh, in the sort of uh, retrograde direction. That means that if you inject it into a neuron, it will not go down the neuron's axon and to the next neuron that it injects to, but it will go up through the synapses, through the dendrites, sorry, and uh, the neurons that connect, that project to it. So if you inject this into V1, this is just a general bolus injection to V1, not layer specific. Uh, here you see, just to get like, uh, you know, an eyeball of the uh, projection density, this is LGN, which is considered the sort of main feed forward uh, projection to, uh, to, to V1. And as you can see, it's uh, a lot less dense than uh, these other areas here. So this is ACC, which uh, I talked about a little bit last week. Uh, and this also was M2, so M2 is this part, uh, no sorry, M2 is this part, uh, ACC is this part, and then like here at the border you have this very dense innervation. Um, and it's, we call it ACC in the mouse, it's just because of like vague anatomical homologs, it has a primate cortex, it's mostly like a, a motor area slash association area, you know, just it's big and it's probably a bunch of different areas that do different things in it. This is retrosplenial cortex. This is all the way in the posterior part of the brain. It's very close to V1. This is a very, this is the biggest uh, input to V1 in general. And then here, just for some, you see the diversity of inputs. You see like the amygdala projects a little bit, the claustrum, which we just make fun of, and the, uh, <laughs> the orbital frontal cortex, uh, part of it. And then of course, there's these intriguing connections from the lateral uh, interrhinal cortex and the uh, CA1 in the hippocampus. These are both very sparse. Yeah. And I believe in, in primates, we don't see that projection to be one from hippocampal areas. Is that right? No, I think that's mainly um, th that's a um, tool, that's a technique thing. So people uh, can't, haven't been able to do this kind of, um, you can do rabies tracing, uh, but you use like to, to pick up the, the signal, you use like these older techniques, and it's not something that's been done. So it's still like an open question. So the people haven't reported them, but nobody's like, we checked and uh, we didn't find them. Yeah, so uh, I think in the Feldman and Van Essen, for example, they don't have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. but that was in the 90s and it was yeah. harder to do these things. Yeah. 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 So one thing that's not shown here, of course, is like uh, the, the effect of these connections, right? So it's yes. well known that the majority of connections to the V1 are not, not from LGM, but it's believed that that's the primary driver of V1. Yeah. Um, so, and this, I assume this covers all layers of the cortex, so we're not being discriminated about which, when you do this sort of injection. Um, this injection is non-discriminative. We do have quantification, mm -hmm. layer-specific and cell type-specific quantifications mm -hmm. that I can ask Derek to pull up. So, yeah, so, you know, the things are, at some point, you, we, if you look at this and some people make the wrong conclusion, mm -hmm. oh, look, most of the inputs of you want to come in from ACC. Well, it could be most of the inputs to some parts of V1 or mm -hmm. from AC, most inputs to some other parts of V1 or not, and it could yeah. be that these are largely modulatory inputs as some people call them, not drivers. Um, so it's hard to put too much, you can just, it's more numerical than it is meaning. Sure, yeah, right. of course it requires some clarification. So um, I don't know about retrosplenial and the other areas. Uh, in ACC, the projection to AC, from AC to V1 uh, is bistratified, it projects to layer one and layer six. Uh, what we were imaging last, what I was showing the imaging last time was obviously layer one because you, it's incredibly hard to do axon imaging layer six. Um, and yeah, there have been a number of old papers and... Um, so that makes sense in some sense if you think of that to layer six, mm -hmm. we've always th thought of that as, uh, you know, representing the sort of the good cell areas down there and mm -hmm. you would want a motor connection to that. Now, I, you know, we think of that as coming in the primate from like, uh, um, not from motor cortex, well, they would be from motor cortex too, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, that could be explaining what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I'm just saying this, these are interesting things we can't speculate too much about, but. Sure, yeah. A couple yeah. of uh, questions on the uh, experimental technique. Um, like, what do we know about the efficacy of like these rabies tracing? Like, how complete are they? Mm -hmm. Like, what number of you know, when you went to so they go all to the end, end of the all of the cells the dead rights and all yeah, the buy, right, how do buy all it, of yeah. them actually propagate back and do all of this, the ones that have propagate back actually, you know, like light up in the time frame mm -hmm. that you have for expressing it? Because of course you have to wait a little bit, right? 
Like you know, if you wait too long, it kills the cells. Yeah, um, exactly, because that's what babies does. That's why babies is bad for you. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm not. I think the serotypes that we use. So all of this affinity and stuff depends on the serotypes. So basically, the viral, the capsid, basically, and the receptors on the capsid. Um, and I think the serotype that most people use, uh, it's BAS90, I think it's called. Um, it's sort of like a decent trade-off between what you said, so it doesn't kill the cells too quickly, and it seems to be uh, pretty general. Mm -hmm. Then again, you know, there's all kinds of biases that people haven't described yet, right? So we know many A, B right. serotypes are like to avoid layer four for some reason, unless you like only restrict them, they'll only be able to express in layer four, and that's how you get layer four expression. Um, is there any known bias regarding the strength of the synapses that are jumped? Yeah, that's also a good question. Uh, so you would imagine, like naively, that the well, the more the more synapses there are, the more likely it is that the rabies will be able to jump. Right, uh, the right. bigger synapses are easier to jump than the smaller synapses. That's also true. So then you you yeah. So if if the trade if that trade off were perfect, sorry, if that trade off were perfect, then the you know LGN and ACC would both be fairly displayed. Like right. it would be a fair representation. I don't really know. I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, but yeah, I could look into this uh, if you want to. Could I ask you one more question? Of course, not. We said it was non-discriminatory. Um, so it, it 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 doesn't distinguish between a particular neurotransmitter system used at the synapse and or whether it's inhibitory or excitatory. Yeah. So as far as I know, uh, I don't think it discriminates between excitatory and inhibitory cells. That being said, most cells are excitatory. Right. Right, of eighty percent, and uh, this could also be a GFP expression issue. So right. yeah, it's um, you know these things are messy. They're, they're kind of like like Jeff said, it's kind of like an eyeballing. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the problem with experiments. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, 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 every technique has its biases. Absolutely, yeah. you just have to until you're very very familiar with all these different techniques, you can be misled. By. Absolutely, yeah. But there's one last question. When we see like you know like one bright dot in these things, mm -hmm. right? You know that sometimes like they like, like stick out of the mass. It's just this one bright dot. I mean, like, is that there. literally like one cell? Yeah, that's so here. Like these are cells and their uh, projections, like right. dendrites and axons. This is just uh, an artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> this stuff happens. It can be a smudge in the yeah. preparation. Right. So you need to be able to like distinguish these. And I'd be like, oh my god, I found a cell. <laughs> it's, and wherever that is. Um, right, so uh, a better quantification of this is just like fluorescence quantification over like uh, slices. Oops. Uh, and so, like the neurotrospinal um, is the, the strongest projection, uh, lateral V2, auditory cortex, and then uh, fourth biggest is a uh, Area two four B, which is uh, that part of MCC that we talked about. Yeah, I thought ACC was big. Where, M two. Oh, where is that? Slash M two. So M two is. Uh, over so where here. is that on the chart? Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, over here. Okay, that's the red one. Yeah. Where's ACC? Is ACC also in that same bar? bar? So we call it slash M two because uh, we're not confident that we will that Separate all our them. counts don't include M two. Uh, so it's more like hey, you know. A lot of caution there. So the thing, yeah, it borders the region, and there's a lot oh, of. Oh, so when you say area 24B, you mean ACCs? ACC, exactly. Okay. Slash M2 because. What's the retrospinal cortex? It, it, we were just talking about that a few months ago. Mm -hmm. It's like a sort of a hybrid type of cortical region. It's uh, and primates. It's not quite standard. Um, because it has granular and a granular. I think yeah, and it's it's sort of like a transitionary. You know, you get to the edge of the neocortical sheet. Mm -hmm. Literally, the adrenal cortex and the hippocampus are on the edge of the neocortical sheet as they fold up underneath the brain. You, mm -hmm. you can follow the surface of these cells around. They, and, so the, and, and I think the retrospinal cortex, at least in primates, it's, on the, it's in the center, um, you know, as V1 folds into the, uh, the uh, solus. Um, it's sort of like it has slightly different structures. Mm -hmm. It's not classic neocortex, it's mm -hmm. somewhere in between. And so, it's, I'm just pointing that out. It's, it's not a quote standard neocortical region. Yeah. It's, a, it's a sort of a hybrid something other. I, don't, I, don't, I forget what we know what it does. Maybe Marcus, you remember. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a mysterious thing. It is. Um, it is a very interesting region. So, uh, one of, like I just mentioned, it has a, there's a granular and a non granular part, meaning it has or doesn't have a layer four. Um, and that's sort of changes in the mouse. I think the more lateral part is the a granular, but I could be wrong. Uh, and connectivity-wise, it has very dense connectivity to the uh, hippocampal uh, formation. Yeah, so it's like halfway between. So you know, if you go to the far end, you get hippocampus, and you get 
you know, enzymatic cortex, and you got retrospinal mm -hmm. cortex, and then, it, then you kind of transition to being more classic neocortex. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just think it's a, from an evolutionary point of view and from a functional point of view, we just we should keep those in mind. It is about. interesting, yeah. So, for example, the orbital co cortex in the, um, in the mouse, or my mouse, uh, the orbital cortex in the mouse is just this like blob. That it does have some structure to it, but it doesn't have any of this like uh, classic, you know, layer one through six yeah. situation. Um, and is it uh, from what you how you responded to Flo's question? Is it true that so postsynaptic layer four is not represented in here? Oh, that would be AAV. Uh, so with rabies, we think it's represented. Oh, so we've done. Okay. We've also done. Yeah, I, I will forward. I'll so this includes review. projections to layer. Four. Yeah, most okay. likely. So, uh, you know, it's a thing where you, you get all this labeling because we have like a local, a different uh, fluorophore that's local, and we see, we confirm that there's labeling that's mostly well distributed in the layer of constellators to make sure it's in V1. Um, this is all monocular V1, by the way, uh, probably with a little bit of binocular too. Um, I, I'll ask Jörg for, um, I don't know how we classify the data, but we have like next to Jörg's office a massive poster with like all of this cell type specific and layer specific rabies tracing results. So uh, I'll try to at least get him to send a picture. Um, I have a feeling we haven't gotten to the meat of your talk yet. We're just looking at this. Sorry. I don't think we've even gotten to any meat of your talk yet. We're just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty to look at. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. It's a great thing we're out of time. All right, right. So, um, anywho. So uh, we went over this last time. Just as a reminder, we found a, a population of stimulus predictive neurons that required experience to form. So condition one is a block of the first two days, and they're not there then. Uh, and the visual neurons seem to be more, uh, they don't seem to have any characteristic uh, evolution with time. right? Uh, and these are about 50-50 split. They're both about 7% of uh, cortical neurons. Uh, I showed you the ACC axons and how they basically do the same thing, but I think I didn't dwell on this as long. So um, basically you see the same types of signals in uh, the ACC axons in V1. Now, subject of debate is like, do we know that these synapses terminate in V1 or are they just passing through? Uh, in the video, uh, it looked like, uh, you know, the, these little dots, these grains, uh, we think are boutons and that's what other people think too. But you know, Always take everything you see with a grain of salt in experimental uh, results. But you did show that ACC has a strong projection it does. too. It absolutely it's just, does. You don't know well, these huh? particular axons. Absolutely, right? Yeah. So we're like, how much of the signal is actually fed to V1 in layer one and how much is just passing by? Of course, this V1 is at the like. Um, It'd be weird to be passing through there. Right? Where would it go, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Like the most uh, posterior area of the brain. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like going to the suburban area yeah, that's passing yeah. through. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes like, just, it just does like a sharp turn at the back and goes like to the liver just doing or something. Else. Because you get hypothesis to assume that there's an actual input. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good working hypothesis. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, right, so we see, for example, so let's say you have a, an axonal segment that likes the stimulus B, right? If you remember this ABABA. Uh, when we show to just see, see if these are visual or not, uh, you know, you show the uh, other grading when you flip it. Remember, we had this condition where we flipped the grading 10% of the trials. Uh, when you flip it, you show that this like weird anticipatory component is still there, but there's no like uh, if there is a visual response to much attenuated, mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa, right? If you have an A axon and you show the A, that's unexpected. There is a visually evoked response. A axon. A, a, oh, so let's sorry. for A. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. my bad. Just, <laughs> right. okay. Given this talk in my lab so many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really so two different things. Things. Um, Right, okay, so we have this. Uh, you can ignore this. We can talk about this later if you want. Um, we have this projection uh, from HC to V1, and one of the prerequisites we had for like this predictive coding thing to work is that uh, you need the coordinate transformations. To work right, so you need the you may need to make sure that the projection from ACC to V1, for example, and all these projections need to talk uh, to the other the other cortical area in the language of that cortical area, right? So um, one thing, and this is in Marcus's paper, um, is that this is not me. This is the th this person's name is Marcus Lineweber. <laughs> just yes, for sorry. people who yeah, are different yeah. Marcus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Another ML. <laughs> yeah, uh, another Marcus's paper. Uh, is that you know you could inject two different fluorophores into like adjacent areas of uh, ACC and see if there's like a retinotopical, if there's a gradient right in the projection to V1. Is it uh, just like all mushed together or is there a gradient? And of course, oops, 
we found a gradient. Uh, so for example, this, you know, you inject a red and a green fluorophore into ACC, you get a uh, red and green innervation being adjacent to each other. And this isn't the only quantification, you know, you can quantify this. There are some interesting patterns. But this just says there's topology. It doesn't say there's a transformation. Yeah, that's a, yes. That's a misleading word, I thought, but yeah, same point. No, but yeah, I mean, the other part of the transformation is that it seems to be in these visual or visual spatial coordinates. So, of course, it's not a conclusive thing. But well, it's talking about coordinates in the brain, not necessarily coordinates in the visual world, necessarily. I mean, it is a supporting finding that they would be court, like visual world coordinates since they're retinotopic, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we think of coordinates like, you know, like grid cells, like three dimensional you know, reference frames. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about coordinate transformations in the brain for a different, for a different purpose. Yeah. Right, right. So these are coordinate transformations in the yeah. sense that they are written topic and in the sense that the signal seems to match the type of signal that is that yeah. we that V1 right. processes. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, which is a non-trivial thing to do, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and another thing is that these predictions should be plastic, right? If they're learned, right, you should be able to reverse them and play with them. So this is something that actually happened by accident and ended up being the main point of Marcus Leinweber's paper. Uh, but which I will briefly talk through. So his project was uh, they had the, this tunnel, right? And uh, it, it was like a 2D tunnel. And in VR, this is very hard for the, not very hard. It takes a while for the mice to learn to do this because they're walking, they're like running on this like uh, little styrofoam ball that just keeps spinning around. So it takes them a while to like learn to control that. So the in you know, the first days, it was very short just to encourage, and you get they get a reward at the end just to you know get them to learn it. And then over time, you know, they would. Uh, you could progressively make it longer. And what happened is that in this tunnel, in this 2D tunnel, uh, you would introduce some perturbations in the angle of the tunnel, right? So if you imagine a mouse, doesn't do it very often, but imagine the mouse is running perfectly straight. You had a perturbation such that it's like 30 degrees off on one side or the other, and then the mouse has to correct for that, right? Um, good. So we, the Marcus imaged axons again in V1, same paradigm, uh, but the, um, but in left and right v1 as well. And what you see is that each area, so left or right v1, is the axons are most responsive uh, when the visual flow is contralateral, meaning that in left v1, you're more, the, the axons most likely when there's more visual flow on the right, right? Because right. that's looking at that part of the brain, and visual flow seems to be a, a, a signal that they like. So this could be via perturbation or just by steering, right? Um, and Likewise for V1, it likes uh, left, uh, for right V1, sorry, uh, it likes left turning flows. Um, and of course, just to disambiguate, you know, the mouse would have to turn in the other direction because it's, you can get confused with like direction of movement and the visual flow that produces, right? Um, so the way that you, just so I get this right, right? So the way that you produce the perception of the tunnel turning mm -hmm. is that you had an increased optical flow mm -hmm. on one side of the of the half the visual half field. No, no, no. Uh, so we weren't perturbing. So it was completely symmetrical, right? What 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 this says is that if the mouse turns, there's more flow. If it's like closer, for example, to one edge, there's more flow on the right side than there is on the left, right? Because you're you're turning. Right, right. Means the mouse is turning left. Yes. Exactly. Right. Uh, or you make the perturbation where you switch, you know, you, you switch it 30 degrees to the right or to the left. Right. So the, the, the visual flow, the tunnel is the same, but the um, visual flow is not symmetric. Right. Right. And, uh, right. So what Marcus did by accident, it turns out, uh, and which happened to be the main point of the paper, was that um, he accidentally reversed, uh, reversed the sign of the coupling such that when the mice would be trying to turn, you know, turning right and you get left visual flow, uh, they instead got right visual flow. And they turn right, somewhere like these right. goggles you could put on. That right, yeah, yeah, left into yeah. right and right into left is absolutely confusing. Yeah. And massive, but you learn it after a while, right? Massive prediction error or yeah. something. Um, mm -hmm. So what they found is that the, in the first day, of course, uh, the, the, these statistics here, so the, the preference of these axons was the same, right? If you have left, right, inverted visual flow. But over time, they it reversed. Basically, this is saying that the uh, ACC axons didn't really care. So this is not about the motor input they're getting. This is about the visual flow input. Right. And this would you would need this if you were able to uh, predict 
if they were predicting visual flow, they would need it would need to be about the statistics of the environment, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I mean, this is just a tuning index. The it shows that it doesn't affect performance if you have normal visual flow. You know, the performance stays the same. This is on the y-axis. Sorry, yeah, the performance is here, and then this is the tuning preference, and it's sort of uniform in the beginning. Then it changes, but the performance is more or less on a bit fast. I don't follow. Sorry. Um, that so this is a this is the performance of the mouse, right? How good? So it's quantified as a percentage of time spent within thirty degrees of the target. Okay. Um, and and uh, this is a tuning preference of the individual axons. Do they prefer controversive or ipsiversive visual flow? Right. Right. So uh, negative would mean they're changing from controversive to ipsiversive. Ah, so the delta of the tuning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And then when you invert the visual flow and you compare first and last days, you see that the performance is you know, on a, more or less unaffected, but compared to the normal visual flow, right? They still learn, right. uh, like one of them didn't, maybe two did, but like, uh, uh, but the tuning, performance, the tuning preference changes, it becomes negative, so it goes to the uh, ipsilateral flow. Right. So it's not just about like uh, huh. topology, yeah. So each individual uh, segment here is a little size. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, right, so I think I showed you all this video at the end last night. So this we're talking about the, the prediction error. So this is when this is when the expected grading is there, and this is the tunnel, right? So time zero the expected grading happened. Um, that was good last time you just yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> And now this is this was the response uh, when you don't see it. So I'll go through it again. So time zero is when the expected grading happens over here. Um, you see, like it doesn't really do much <laughs> because V1 doesn't do vision. So this is just one example. Like this is a very uh, ubiquitous thing we found across all mice. Uh, except one mouse. Um, and so just to, because biology, right? <laughs> um, so uh, this is when we, so yeah. So here, instead of showing uh, the other grading 10% of the time, we just didn't show anything 10% of the time, right? And this was all isoluminant. This wasn't like a brightness change uh, effect. And you find that omitting the stimulus drove by far the biggest uh, responses in V1. If you compare this to like, the mean response to the A or the B grading, it's there, but it's much, much smaller. Um, it's a bit noisier because of the, the fraction of trials. It's only 10%, right? You'll always get this. Um, and you can you know, just find, make up an arbitrary selectivity criterion and say, look, these are neurons that are uh, selectively responsive to the emission because we quantified them as such, right? Um, and uh, as I mentioned previously, the omission doesn't drive any changes in the ACC axons. It's only locally in V1. Whereas the predictions, if you want to call them that, and other visual signals are in the axons. So this would support, and we have other data with sensory motor uh, mismatches that supports that the, the error computation, uh, if that's what you want to call it, it happens locally in V1, in layer two, three, specifically. Mm -hmm. We don't really see it in layer five. Um, because the, the, the argument is otherwise where would the omission neurons get that strong signal from, so to speak. Exactly. So this is like a sort of you're subtracting the input, the visual input from the prediction. But how does that necessarily prove that it's local? Because it could come also from, theoretically, right, from any of the other yes. inputs that you showed. Does it prove it? It supports the argument. <laughs> right. Uh, it's consistent with the argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, it could be. But uh, we've looked at other Many other projections so far, we don't see mismatch signals. We could be doing something wrong. But uh, all the mismatch signals we've seen are local to V1. And of course, they happen in V2 uh, and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. All the sensory, sensory motor mismatch, that is. All right, cool. So this has been like the uh, pretty much what my project has done. And they've added some of uh, Marcus Leinweber's awesome work. Um, and we sort of, uh, Alex Eitinger, who's in uh, Lisa Giacomo's lab at Stanford now, uh, if you guys want to talk to him, and Bill Lang, who's at UCLA and was here, had this amazing paper where they looked at like uh, sensory motor learning 
of experience they had like mice that were dark weird and then they only learned like uh, they learned have they have them learned uh, like to run on the ball but the flow had nothing to do with their running it had to do with what the next mouse was doing and they did not have these mis mismatch signals but this is not what I'll get into here it's just a lovely paper for you to read it's like the most thorough thing I've ever seen in my life uh, but like sort of they they did a bunch of like uh, cell type specific imaging and perturbations optogenetic and dreads dreads is a chem chemogenetic uh, perturbation so you had a chemical that like selectively silences or uh, activates one one cell type and they found that this sort of uh, the, this classic SSTVIP uh, 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 somatostatin and sorry yes the, like seven um, faso uh, intestinal peptide right. um, uh, so this is like uh, Adam Kepex and a couple other people have found that to consider this to be a very canonical type of circuit in uh, cortex, at least in layer two three, right? Where you have uh, pyramidal neurons are inhibited by somatostatin neurons that are themselves inhibited by VIP. So the VIP activation disinhibits right. the pyramidal cells. So I'm sure you're all yeah <laughs> very familiar with this. So for example, if you inhibit um, if you inhibit SS, uh, the somatostatin neurons here, for example. The, uh, you don't get a mismatch signal when the, when you get like the mismatch of that occurring. Oh, those don't, those don't. Sorry. Yeah, try to understand that. Right. Yeah. Please uh, visit. So you know this is this was all done with sensory motor mismatch. So this is just like the mouse is running and there's visual flow coming to the back and then you interrupt that visual flow and the mouse is still running. Right. That's a sensory motor mismatch paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, and normally it looks like this, the population average, right? So this is just a, a signal here. So hold on, that red circle on the diagram to the left says I have oh, knocked out or deactivated the SST. Yeah, so this or is SST expressing cells. Uh, yes, yeah, so sorry, this is crimson R. Uh, it's crimson that, wait. What is RHT? I think Archaeorhodopsin is the inhibitory one, right? Yeah, okay, crimson is the excitatory one. Um, mm -hmm. What is the overall? Um, learning from this paper. I mean, like, put aside the details, of right? What is the right? Yeah. So uh, the learning is that somatostatin neurons uh, seem to be um, uh, seem to be visually driven. They they do not very motor driven. Whereas VIP neurons um, and NPY neurons are seem to be more motor driven. Um, hmm. And by having these two layers, and by you know, you can invert um, where the so let me just think about this. Follow this thing. So you have this primary inhibition, which is coming from visual input, mm -hmm. and then that can be disabled by a motor input. Yeah. And how? What do you? What do you take away from that? Good question. So uh, you can see this in this diagram here. Well, let's say you have a top-down input. Let's say the set like motor prediction input or just a motor input, and it can innervate either the uh, apical, sorry, the distal. Uh, Dendritic tree, or um, or the one of these interneuron types, right? Let's say it's uh, well, let's that would say be the SST, VIP. right? Well, let's say it's uh, it's it's a long range projection, so it's excitatory. So let's say this is VIP. This would inhibit the SST, for example. Yes. Uh, so this gives you a way to have two different signs to your uh, prediction error: the positive and negative sign, meaning it's a prediction minus the input or the input minus the prediction. Right, that's the idea of, uh, right. of a dysynaptic complex circuit like this. That you can use the same with an input that splits, and you can do two things. It can either target an interneuron that inhibits your target, or it can you know help excite it. Exactly. So is this all in support of the whole predictive coding idea? Is that is that, the idea? Is that is that where this is leading? Like, is there evidence for that? Um, I'm trying to bump it up highest level if I can. Right, right. So the, the evidence, I mean, the evidence is that like if it would happen, this would be a circuit that's consistent with it. And yeah. it came to be very consistent with like how the, what we know about the circuit. Mm -hmm. So if the somatostatin is visually driven and you have a weak motor input, it's not disinhibited by the it's not inhibited by the VIP. And so the mismatch neuron, if you have a yeah, a mismatch neuron here, it would be inhibited uh, by the visual input. Mm -hmm. Right? And then of course if you Arrange it differently, you would have it excited by the visual, the visual input, right? Be just because of where the, the top down, if you want to call it, innervation happens to go in that neuron, in that little little microcircuit of one neuron into uh, or several more SSD and VIP cells. Uh, is everyone following for this? I think you probably lost a few people. Okay. Well, yeah, the thing is, you know, the following is two different things in my world. Like, 
You can follow the details of the experiment, and you can just walk down every little point here, but then you can also lose track of the big picture. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, okay, yes, we showed that this exists just like this, but what's the point of it all? <laughs> it's like, I mean, there's a lot value in understanding these details, but there's also, as a theorist, you try to like, okay, what did we learn about this? And what's the, what are the bigger picture implications of this, which is sometimes very difficult to get out of an experimental paper. Um, and that's what, I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to get here. Um, which, so the details, oh yeah, I can follow the details, but what, what, am I, what does it mean right, to right. me? So, so it's like a What's the policy? Gotcha. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood the mechanism because you know this thing happens to me. You know, it's frequently this transition from like details to bigger picture isn't. You know, you're, you're going to miss. Simply not stuff. there at all. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if you imagine you can do it, the bigger picture is going to be too simple to describe. It's going to be like, yeah, this 90% of what we understood, but like 10% is something we don't really understand, or it's doing something much subtler, which you need to understand the actual circuit. Yeah, uh, I don't think this is the case here, but I'm just yeah. saying in general. Yeah. Um, so, right, so the policy, if you will, is uh, this. This was from Derek's uh, review with Tom versus Logal. Uh, it was great, great review. Uh, highly recommend it. So the idea is this, the, you have a top-down prediction, and this can make two types, this can lead to two types of error signals. You have one where it inhibits here it inhibits the pyramidal neurons and then the bottom-up stimulus excites them and this would be what they call a type 1 uh, prediction error which is that you know if your if your input matches your if your prediction matches your sensory input of course it you know, should be silent but like this would look like a what a visual cell a visually evoked uh, response would look like right so we're arguing it's not necessarily just like the feed forward connectivity plus all the pooling and stuff that layer four might do. Uh, this is actually a subtraction uh, with a prediction. So if you're seeing something unpredicted, the visually evoked response will be stronger. Right. That's uh, I mean, uh, the, the main thing about predictive coding, it minimizes activity when everything is, is the, when the world behaves as it should behave according to the learned model, mm -hmm. it's very, very little. Exactly, and that's why like one reason why we think layer two, three is very sparse. Right. Um, because your brain mostly gets it right. Um, and you have the other type of error signal, which is, you know, if you if you excite the distal the, the distal dendrites, and then the bottom-up sensory input, you know, inhibits the neuron, then you're subtracting prediction, you know, you're doing prediction minus input, right? So you have these two types of error signals. And then out here somewhere it must be an internal representation because you can't only have predictions. Why can't you only have predictions? Well, I mean, you could theoretically, if you're an engineer, come up with a little way that you know you, your prediction errors, uh, you have prediction errors, and you could you have predictions. You could re recover the state, right? Of course, but um, the internal representation neurons seem to be something to. Uh, we're using this mainly to explain what we see in layer five. And what we see in layer five is very dense activity. It probably still can. So we're using by internal representation. Uh, Basically, the. State I mean, you need to have some sort of. Is that a representation of what? Right, a representation of uh, whatever it is that this part of cortex is happening to compute at this time. So it could be like a conjunction of motor information, sensory information. So, I mean, in some sense, you have to have like an internal model to make a prediction to begin with, right? Exactly. Is that what this is? Is that the internal model? Because your predictions are coming from elsewhere in this yeah. model, in your this experiment. You're exactly. looking for long range predictions. And I was arguing in the last meeting, I was saying, but well, we think most of these predictions are occurring locally and in addition to the long but yeah. certainly a lot of local, and is that what that is? Is that your internal model for the world? Yes, yeah, so it is that it's in terms of predictions and also the sort of thing that would uh, be projected to, like, let's say, another cortical area to serve as a source of predictions. Well, or, or, or maybe it could also locally. directly, yeah, it could be just local too. Yeah, yeah, it could also yeah. be, yeah, but you know, we, we think this happens in the deep layers. This is just a sort of educated conjecture here, so it's not. Uh, so this could be, if this were ACC, for example, you'd see the same circuit, but let's say these internal representation neurons could somehow directly or indirectly be leading to this like innovation of layer of V1, for example. This could be like the prediction neurons. So I'm not fully sure what, what we are getting out here in like sort of like that second like underneath that you call the internal representation mm -hmm. neurons. Because essentially that's computing a difference of two different errors. Right? I like, guess uh, yeah. like the, the, the left circuit uh, is essentially computing the, 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 the bottom up input minus the top down prediction, whereas the right circuit does the exact opposite. Right? So you get two different kinds of errors. 
-hmm. And what the circuit underneath is then essentially doing is because you're, you're subtracting them from each other, you're creating like a difference mm -hmm. of the two. So I'm not exactly so, yeah, sure how uh, to understand that. Right. Like particularly with respect to the recurrence that happens there, mm -hmm. like you're feeding back that output, that difference between the two arrows back into the two circuits. I'm, I'm not sure I follow. Right, yeah, I don't remember what Jared's point was with mm -hmm. that feeding it back. So let's say if you have, a, if you're subtracting two types of error signals, let's say sense, something that looks like a sensory signal and something that looks like a predictive signal. If you subtract them, uh, if you subtract two errors, what is the computational benefit of that? I don't have any ideas. Anyway, I'd like to not get caught up in time. Uh, it might be sort of, you, you get all the, you add up all the errors and that gives you what, how you need to move your state, how you need yeah, to change your state. That, yeah, that's right. And that would, that would, as a machine learning person, that's the kind of thing I'd want to so hypothetically, if the, if the signs of the errors cancel each other, what does that mean? Would mean that you, um, yeah, I know, right? So, well, no, it wouldn't cancel each other. It's, it's you might have more negative and less positive at one point in time, somewhere, some other time, you might have more positive and less negative. Right. But if you add them together, you get the gradient. You get the overall direction that you need to change. Right. If they're exactly equal, then it'd be zero. Yeah. Uh, but it's a noisy system, so you want to add it all up. Well, most of the more error symbols come in when you're doing the differences from your picture. So I'm just trying to figure out how do you, what does it, what does it mean if if this guy says I think we're errored in this direction, this guy says I think we're errored in this direction, and they cancel out. What does that mean? Well, if they cancel out, that means the average is zero. But in general, it wouldn't cancel out. In general, one would be higher if you're thinking scalar numbers. In general, one would be higher than the other. Right. Just like in deep learning, you know, you, you have a, a node that projects to many other nodes, and you right. accumulate the gradient, add up all the gradients, and that gives you an overall delta for that node. So that particular case, you would you would not have a you, you could have arbitrary magnitude of errors coming from the from the two right. different modalities, but you can't make a decision based upon they're not, not agreeing with each other as to the... Well, it's not two different modalities. It's the same modality. It's just that, you know, it's not two things. There's it's well, hundreds it's of these things, and they're all noisy, and they're all error-prone themselves. So by averaging together all of the errors, you get an overall more accurate estimate of which... what Okay, what so this is, not a, this is not a detailed thing where, you know, this particular, you know, motor input and this particular visual input Cancel That's what my interpretation of that mm -hmm. that convergence is. Okay, so it's not you're aggregating multiple error signals into one, and you need something like that to update your internal representation. In our world, you know that might be the location space where you are in the location space, and right. you need to update that based on some notion of which direction you're moving. So if, if, right. if, there, if the error signals are conflicting with each other, then you don't know what to do. So you don't do it. So. No, if the error signals are exactly opposite and equal, that means the average is zero. It's not that you don't know what you to do, it's just you're saying your average is zero. And then what do you do? That that, so then you don't move. That means you're not doing anything. Right, right. Yeah. That's, and when you do move, you'll be updating in that direction. I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's something that says I'm confused. <laughs> no, the prediction error is the confusion. So if there's a ton of confusion, there's a, if the error is high, that means you're not predicting well. That is the confusion, but the confusion in this case oh, could be right. positive or negative. Yeah. Yeah. So in some sense, the, the, mm -hmm. the parameters on the left here mm -hmm. are visually responsive neurons, mm -hmm. but they somehow you know, get potentially attenuated by the prediction. Mm -hmm. Whereas the right ones are the predictive neurons mm -hmm. that potentially get attenuated by the visual stimulus. Mm -hmm. So. In some sense, that circuit underneath that is computing the difference of those is still, um, is still a you know, visually selective neuron, but it takes an inhibitory input from some prediction error neuron. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that seems fine now. I just still don't understand what the currency is doing to that. Yeah. Uh, so let's say, it, it, let's say it inhibits this one and it potentiates this one. So because it feeds back on itself, which means like in, in theory, whatever signal you're producing gets cancelled out. I mean those those kinds of circuits exist a lot throughout the column. There's handshake protocols all the time, right? <laughs> so when an area projects from 
one area to the next, it also silences the, the, the incoming area in the step after. So if you have strong projection from layer four to layer two, three, there's also going to be projection to inhibitory neurons that then shut down layer four. If you're projecting from layer two, three to layer five, there's going to be some inhibitory neurons that then shut down the inputting layer two, three neurons. Meaning whatever input you are getting, um, you're saying, thank you very much, and I'll shut up. Mm -hmm. um, so they will, I mean, what, yeah, so in the light of that, what this could be is uh, it's saying, okay, uh, I just calculated this difference here, and this is what I, I'm, what I think I'll be seeing uh, in next delta t, right? Right. Uh, and then, yeah, and then you're comparing that. So this could be like, yeah, some of the dynamics of how the. Uh, I mean, this would make the circuit would make a lot more sense in a in a in a, in a, in a temporal domain. Yeah. Um, because yeah, if like looking at these circuits like this, it's like all linear and all the inputs are equal and all happens at the same time. Yeah, of course, that's subsumed, right? Right, yeah. and whereas in reality, all this is unfolding in time, and that plays a big role in how this thing actually plays out, right? Yeah. We, we discussed a model of, um, of uh, visual streams in O'Reilly paper that made some interesting argument about you know, predictions essentially being computers through different phases with thalamocortical projections, um, like using the temporal difference between the two, and essentially the brain is switching between, you know, like, uh, prediction and and you know uh, stimulus input mm -hmm. and there's neurons that are essentially computing the temporal uh, difference between those two phases. Mm -hmm. um, there's no phases here, but of course there's a temporal dynamics of this yeah. uh, if, in, in in these signals. Um, and I don't think we can tell what this looks like unless one makes some basic assumptions about these cell types and actually simulates that circuit. Yeah. Like that is just I mean that's just a drawing. Right? Um, I mean, I, that's not a microcircuit. Like a microcircuit unfolds in time, there's actual spiking neurons, right? Yeah. So again, I'm gonna try, I, it's, I see you're on slide 20 or 30. Oh no, these are, the, the other ones are all by us. Okay, okay, so how close are we to the end of what you- This is the end. Oh, then, oh right, okay, right. Yeah. For this, this is the bigger picture, but yeah. there's not a bigger, bigger picture. <laughs> no, but okay. we can go into specifics and support about the bigger picture, yeah. but uh, yeah. so, yeah. see this, yeah. I think it's interesting to try to reconcile um, the whole predictive coding world um, with our understanding of what we study here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I've, never, I've never really liked the predictive coding one aspect of it where people talk about, oh, what's passed up the cortical hierarchy is the error. Mm -hmm. and I just don't believe that. I don't think that's right. But, but, it's, but it's possibly partially right. So like, just let me see if I can just reconcile our kind of views of the world. Uh, I believe that a cortical column on its own, you know, millimeter square cortical column, is a complete sensory motor inference system. Mm -hmm. It's got every cortical column has a motor output, every cortical column has some sort of input, which is, can be sensory from other regions. The brain has to learn a model of the world. Now, when we talk about rats running a maze, that's a very particular type of model. Right? We think more generally about models of objects and things you see and so on. And so you've got this model of the world in here, and the model has to be a predictive model. So the model is you just look at a single cardinal column, it's going to be making predictions, it's going to be generating a motor behavior, it's basically building some model of what it's observing in its entirety. It doesn't require other parts. In general, it doesn't require a lot of other parts of the cortex to do this. But then, of course, these, these cardinal columns have to communicate with each other, right? And so I believe there's predictions going on within, within a cardinal column, and many of those are silent. They don't, they're, as I've talked about, they're like the neuron states, uh, the internal uh, depolarizations. But then you have like, okay, well, I have another cortical column someplace else, and these have to communicate with each other, right? All right, so maybe this part of the cortex can tell this guy what to expect. We've always talked about it here as sort of a voting. It's like, what I know can influence what you know, and what you know, we can all reach common consensus about this. You can think of voting perhaps as a type of prediction. It's like saying, I already figured something out, or I have, I have some knowledge about the world, and I'm telling you that I'm influenced what you're, you know, this is what you should be seeing too. And this guy can see, yeah, but I have something, and I'm not telling you what you should be seeing. There could be differences, and those could be like a consensus if you reach like a equilibrium. Yes, basically, these are, we, we've talked about these, are, these, are, these can be anywhere from certain to very uncertain. Mm -hmm. But the many cortical columns, all these long range connections in the cortex are basically voting to try to reach a cons of, of the some section that's observing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say um, I'm touching the, touching this pen and I'm 
and I'm looking at the pen and I'm feeling its temperature and maybe it's even making a sound. All those have to be united to the perception of this pen. And so everybody's voting, the hands, the touch areas are saying, ah, I think I'm touching a pen, this guy's saying I'm seeing a pen, and they're all like, yeah, we're doing that. Anyway, we don't think of that as like a, we haven't talked about it as a prediction, we've been talking about it as a, uh, reaching a consensus about what should be expected at any moment in time. And this morning it says these are dynamic and temporal time. So these things might, somebody's knowledge may precede what the other one senses. So then you could look at it as a prediction, right? Um, I'm predicting, I, I'm, I think I got this, and therefore you should see this. And this is, well, I'm seeing this, but therefore you should feel that. Yeah. Um, and so you can make it. So, but these, of course, can't be silent. These are long-range predictions. They have to be your axons that are projecting. I mean, you have to, they have to be active. Whereas maybe 90% of the predictions that occur here do not have to be active. Um, so, um, and, and so we could think of maybe it was our voting circuitry as sort of these sort of, uh, uh, predictions you're talking about here. Um, so I, I'm just trying to, you know, I listen to your talk. I say, okay, I believe everything you say. I'm, I'm not going to challenge anything. I'm just thinking like, how do I help, you know, how do I reconcile these kind of views of the world uh, in some ways? I'm just, just throwing out some thoughts of that. No, absolutely, and what you just mentioned recently, like with the long range prediction, that's exactly what we think is going on, right? Or what we suspect is going on. It's like this kind of, I expect you to see this because I have this type of information. Right? Yeah. Uh, and it's also like a concurrent consensus. I'm like, okay, this is still happening. What's your stats? Yeah. Sort of we just, we haven't yeah. used the word prediction for that. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm just saying it's the same thing in some yeah. sense. You could talk, I'm just pointing out that the word when we talk about voting between columns, that is a some sense of type of prediction. It's, it's absolutely um, uh, even if it, it could be vague. In our, in our case, though, the voting can be ambiguous. It could be like I don't know what. It could be A, B, or C. Yeah. All those are possible. So I wouldn't call it right. Then it's kind of harder to call it a prediction. It's well, it like, could be like a well, no, more like I have uncertainty. These are the possibilities of the things that might be happening. So oh, we've, we've talked about how our, this voting, essentially, everybody can be ambiguous. Uh, like the different parts of your skin that are touching the coffee cup are ambiguous, but together, they know it's a coffee cup. Uh, individual finger can't know that it's a coffee cup, but together they can. And so, so each finger has uncertainty, and it's like it's more like this union of possibilities, and then you narrow down to the only common thing. Uh, so I can still call that a prediction, but it's not the kind of prediction most people talk about, like, oh, you should be predicting X now. Well, that still needs to happen, though, right? Because imagine, you know, like, like this type of spatial prediction, we're going to walk here. Like, I know that this is what's going to happen. There is a temporal prediction component to it. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, I know I'm moving my, uh, I'm moving my arm. I need to know that it's going to end up here because I need to, I need to have that confidence. I need to like plan ahead to, to be able to do that thing. And this gives you a mechanism for planning ahead, by the way, like for simulating into the future yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So that is something the brain needs to do eventually. Like, how it fits into. The union of both these models, or the difference of both these models, is uh, you know. well. Each one of these is a sensory. I'm a little confused by something you said. That each one of these is a sensory motor model. So yeah. if I know I'm moving, the guy on the left can say, "Yeah, I have, I know I'm moving my fingers at this my finger this distance. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I know what I'm going to feel." And um, um, I mean, or something along these lines is falling apart. In that, but but so then at that point in time, you can say, "Yeah, well, you should be seeing that," or something like yeah, that. Exactly, um, yeah. Um, but that's a different, I mean, there's a couple things going on there. I, I don't know for if we're actually passing, um, I'm not sure what actual information you're passing there. Am I passing like the motor information? I, or it's more like I think I'm passing, here's what I'm expecting given my movements. Um, because the eye, the eye region and the somatosensory region don't can't talk to each other in terms of their, their individual movements. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know what they represent. They don't, uh, the eyebrow area doesn't know what movements it's mass sensory. Yeah. They, they don't actually know what the area represents. It's just saying there's another it's doing, it's doing. there's another area there that says they're expecting something. Can I you know? But right. I, so you need coordinate transformations. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I think I think we try to keep the coordinate. Again, our world coordinate transformations like we saw coordinates, and right, right, that yeah. could be local. Uh, but can I point out that there's two kinds of transformations happening here? So. Um, so, so one thing is, of course, yeah, the topology needs to map because otherwise you, you can't do yeah. that kind of thing in the, in the, in the topological uh, local circuit, right? Mm -hmm. So the local circuit here is to correspond to the local circuit in the ACC. And that's fine, and those topological mappings exist, so that's fine. But the other thing that, that happens, it's not really, I mean, you're not, this model does not presume that there's some kind of prediction error being passed down, right? The, the error is computed locally uh, with respect to the model that is locally within that column, right, as Jeff would put it. Um, 
And um, so we do think it's communicated, I mean, between areas. So, so, the, so the question is what exactly is being communicated? Right. It's clear that you are talking about a signal at, that maps onto a very specific spot in, in, in space, mm -hmm. right, on the retina. So there's that, that map that is guaranteed by that mapping. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that like that voting signal, right, as we refer to it, uh, that is understood uh, directly. Mm -hmm. So by, by that local model. So there's some kind of transformation and incorporation, yeah. which is why the, the actual error is like produced locally. So like what you saw in the in the submission response that they, that there's no fine from the ACCs, right? Essentially saying there is no vote. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the way maybe all right. We might we all been talking using the same words to mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm with, I mean, if you're saying if you don't believe an error is propagated, I'm with you on that. I don't think errors are propagated. I and mean, that's the core hypothesis of the critical coding scheme, which you could be saying you could be passing uncertainty, which is kind of like an error. You could be saying, I can either know this is X or I don't know, it could be X, Y, and Z, in which case you could be, you know, it, it, so you might think like, like that's an error um, in some sense. Yeah, but that's no, I, can, I can, I can. Describe it in a more Bayesian sense. Okay. Um, I'll help you. Yeah, so it's <laughs> what we're passing in here is the distribution of states that are possible given the evidence you have so okay, far. Okay, I agree with that, right? but is that an error? No, that's not an error, okay. but it would be if you're unsure, that distribution would be larger. Yeah. If you're really sure, that would be one thing. No. If you're 100% sure, you would be passing, here's exactly what I think it is. Um, and you would pass that on. If you're, if you're, it could be two or three things, it'd be a larger signal that's a union of several yeah. things. And that's like almost a pure Bayesian thing. It's the yeah, distribution sure of possibilities that are consistent with the evidence so far. And that will look, in it's analogous to error in the sense that it will be high when you're confused. Yes. Uh, and it'll be, yeah, but it's much more powerful than an error signal. Right. Uh, it can do everything an error signal can do, but it's much more powerful. Well, the thing is, what you need to think about is how, how our individual neurons neurons get computed because they get like a it wouldn't be it wouldn't be individual neurons exactly it'd so be it's a population no code, right so it'd be an, it'd be an SDR yeah uh, doing unions <laughs> doing unions no literally so uh, what do we yeah. make of the fact that in the omission case the ACC acts on some side right yeah so that would tell you so let's do that again with, in the omissions case right so when it is actually ambiguous. What, 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 they had rats running, what happened? Which, which state? So you don't show the, you don't actually don't show the stimulus, and then in D1 you get this huge response, but you don't get okay. anything in the ACC axons. Right. Yeah. So there is no vote. That's what I am. Right? But, but the, 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 the visual cortex itself can make this prediction and say there's an error. Right. Yeah. Right. Just why I don't need the ACC. I don't, again, that's my point. Every column is a self contained unit. Yeah. Well, the things you, you need to have, like, yeah, of course, you know, the V1, for example, does have its own motor components. And from what I remember, it seems to have a lot to do with like, projections to the um, superior colliculus. Yes. And yeah, of course, but they have like other types of kind of motor coordinates and motor frames in which like you would need to have a type of prediction, such as like, you know, just visual flow, for example. Um, and sort of, you know, things that are coming from um, when, when you run, for example, your visual colliculus, the superior colliculus has more to do from what I recall, was they're making saccades. Well, yeah, but I think in it, you know, it's classically viewed as making saccades in the primate. From my understanding, that uh, superior colliculus is actually a much more broad-based uh, primitive motor system. Yeah, it also does head head, head turning, head. and I wouldn't be surprised if it's responsible for running things in the mouse. It's it's like a it's it's a it's a primitive motor sensory system, <laughs> and um, more hardwired. Um, so it's not limited to vision and isocots, it's a large part of it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, there, there, there are like other types of more global or other kinds of motor, sensory motor problems, which, uh, you know, obviously we have other, that other cortical areas exist, uh, but it seems to take some responsibility in recruiting them. You know, one thing, another thing, just, just, I'm sorry to jump all around here, but no, it's another thing, when you talk about prediction, the way I view the, the, the brain is kind of always remember that neurons don't know anything, and the cortical region doesn't know anything. Yeah. Just getting some inputs and just trying to model those inputs. I have no idea what it represents. And if I got a part, uh, if I'm getting a, a cortical column getting input from a somatosensory input, and I get another one getting visual input, they don't know that. So how do they communicate? What could they possibly tell each other? Mm -hmm. They can't assume anything about knowledge of the other person. The only, the only thing they can assume, the only way our voting works, the only way these long-range connections work, is that 
we can assume they're both observing the same thing in the world, the same structure in the world, even though they're observing it differently. So that's the only guaranteed by them not being so that's the only thing that they can share. I, my error, like my visual, this I have a visual error. Uh, oh, I was expecting this visual input and I got this input, so now I calculate some error, visual error. I can't share that with anyone because it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. It's like, uh, it's, that's, that's gotta be handled internally because I, I, the, the language of visual error is not a language that's being shared with another column. But everybody could say I have ambiguity about what I'm viewing because we're all viewing the same thing. And so even though I don't know how you're viewing it, like you may be viewing it through uh, viewing it as a vision, I'm viewing it through touch, and someone else viewing it through hearing, we're all sensing the same thing. Uh, at least we can we can try to vote on that because even though I don't know how you're sensing it, we're all agreeing that this is the same thing. So I think about these long range connections. To me, uh, an error cannot be it can't be an error in a particular central modality. It has to be. So I, I, so I don't think I, so I don't think I don't believe in the error propagation idea of, of critical coding because I don't think another cortical column or region could understand my error. But it, it would have some symmetry with uh, how, for example, the retina, how it sort of is outputting diffs, so sort of outputting things, how things have changed. You interpret mm -hmm. the error as being something of how things changed from what it was before. Uh, is that an that, error or is that just an observation? You, you can. Uh, um, you could you could format that as an error. I mean, uh, so is that, is that a prediction like an error? Well, if the prediction is it's going to stay the same, then optical flow is an error signal. Well, I would call it an error signal, but you could call it what you want. Like you alluded to, these um, all, all these most uh, most like cortical cortical projections that we know of are uh, symmetric, right? So there is a projection from AC to V1, there's a projection from yeah. V1 to AC to C. And they're not, they're, their layers are different. So like the, wherever these, uh, these are, I think. Well, well there's, a, there's, there's two broad classes of cortical cortical projections, ones that are asymmetric and ones that are, are symmetric in terms yeah. of layer by layer. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of, so we try to make that distinction because there's a lot of connections that are like, oh, from, you know, maybe cortical thalamic projections or layer, you know, layer, um, uh, I don't know, layer three to layer four, or something like that, um, or backwards to layer one. Those are asymmetric in terms of the anatomy. That clearly has to do something about some sort of hierarchical structure, and that's the classic Feldman estimate. But there's a lot of connections, like layer five uh, to layer five, the smaller layer five cells. Yeah, yeah like which are just they just go everywhere and they go back and forth. So to us, that's the voting area. Those are the voting connections. Mm -hmm. They tend to be everywhere. They go all over the place, lacking of um, hierarchy, lacking of topology. They're basically vote. You can vote with anybody. It doesn't matter where they are, as long as they're observing the same thing. Whereas if you have these asymmetrical connections, which is what Feldman and Essen focus on, then that's clearly some more hierarchical type of structure, uh, which is, we think is related to compositionality. But uh, I just want to make that distinction because it's that took me many years to figure out um, the difference between those two. So when we talk about voting, we're tending to talk about the the layer, the common layer, iso layer to layer. Um, similar, not this asymmetrical connection. Mm -hmm. Just that's a sure. That's, that's a different, that's two right. different thing. Uh, um, so we have to be careful when we're talking about which ones. Right. So you see this. Uh, you see this flat line in ACC in the projection, but you know there is that doesn't refute that the, there's a projection from V1 to ACC, another layer that says like, hey, this is the this is the error. ACC then has to if if ACC gives like a spatially one thing I didn't focus on so much uh, that I probably should have focused on, and the, these are these predictions have to have have to happen in the spatial context. They are spatially evoked predictions. It's not like a, just sequencing. So what you need to get from ACC, at least for in this case, is like a spatial like. We should spatial. You're talking about topology in the cortex. Sorry, I mean spatial in terms of visual, visual uh, of like in grid cell space, like space in the environment. Uh, so. So it's not just a temporal sequence. Yeah. It's not a certain amount of time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's said just. Place on the track that this right. happens. Yeah, right. Critical. So in our model, this, the computation that ACC would have to do is like, okay, I have a place that I think I'm in. I have, and then I need to, out of that, I need to decompose a prediction right. of what V1 should see given these coordinates. Given this the argument being that the x-axis here is time, but it really ideally shouldn't be. Um, right. Yeah. Because I mean, underneath that is space. space. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. how I came to view it too. Even in our sequence memory. Yeah. That I used to be thinking, oh, these are the elements in time, and now I think about, no, these are the 
these are the locations in the in the melody. <laughs> right. not, really, not really have to be ordered, but they're really just location space. Right. Right. And then maybe the reference frame is linear, so yeah. it turns yeah. into temporal sequence, yeah. but um, yeah. Right, so the first experiment I ever did, I was gonna, uh, my project was gonna be to investigate the projection from CA1 and uh, the Torino cortex to, to B1, uh, which is much sparser. And the first experiment I did, there's no like mismatch or anything here, it's just like a, a, a tunnel, like the other one with a bunch of different textures on it and the mouse would just run. Mm -hmm. right. So these are uh, LEC slash CA1 axons in B1. You can't really disintegrate them because you, you, know, you have to make an injection and it's going to take all. So the projections from CA1 into V1. V1 layer 1, yeah. Right. And also LEC into layer B1, uh, B1 layer 1. Okay. So uh, assume there's some mixture, but this is one axon in the segment that I'm showing you here. So this axon segment seems to like, this is a space, right? This is distance along the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And this is just the number of trials. So each trial is just plot. It's like a Rask amount. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it like it seems to like these two patterns a lot, right. specifically the last one, right? But except like you know, almost all patterns they loop out over time. Like, right. Like, there's yeah. a lot of activity in the first twenty trials. Yeah. Then it habituates. Except, except, except for the last time. pattern, for some reason that right. stays very active. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say maybe like this is just a, com a competition for like let's say a dynamical process in which it settles into like these two patterns. Mm -hmm. So what it is is suggested, by the way, that the, the more circular oval patterns are, 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 are selected for both of yeah. them, and then it becomes a little bit more discriminatory. One could argue that the first three times the rat ran through the maze, it didn't just notice the difference between those two yeah. circular things and say, yeah, those are the same, and said, like, well, they're slightly different. Yeah, you could, yeah. I, I didn't do enough quantification on this. It was only sure, a few looks like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is like somewhere around see. somewhere around trial twenty-five. Say, wait a second, these are different. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what I, what I did is that I actually just turned off the projectors. It's not a very clean uh, experiment. Let's say in these trials, uh, the red, outline in red, I turned off the projector. And this and a couple other axes on the same. So the rat, rat's not seeing anything? Yeah, so here, they're yeah. not seeing anything. It's dark. Running in the dark. They can still see. It's not like a controlled dark. They can still see some of their surroundings. Very oh, but, the, but they're not seeing those patterns. They're not seeing, they're not seeing, they're not seeing anything. Yeah. Yeah, virtual reality screen is gone dark. Exactly, it's gone dark. So, it's still fired. This, of course, the, the, you know, dude, <laughs> you, like the whole brain is so super active in there. Uh, and what this, I mean, this is noisy, uh, but I saw this in a few other cells. There seems to be something like a phase procession, not, not a phase procession, a procession, where with each trial, there's like an increasing uncertainty of where you are. And I don't know if you've seen these sort of uh, uh, daylight entrainment, the circadian clock entrainment things. So, so does you, the rat know when it gets to the end, or does it just keep going and going and going? Guesses. That's my idea. Oh, yeah. So it's basically it's off. And it keeps getting further and further. It keeps getting further, further, further. You're inferring that diagonal line. Yeah, there. yeah. It's it's accumulating air. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. Right. Circadian entrainment, for example, if you don't right. have a light source. So you get yeah, because there's no recurrent signal, so you yeah. keep drifting. You keep drifting. Yeah, you know, that's pretty accurate, though. Actually, to be off by that amount. Uh, these are pretty long trials, right? And yeah. How the rats running? How long? Uh, what is the, the sort of equivalent distance of one of these? Uh, the equivalent distance would probably be a couple of meters. So, so you, rats running here. We're talking. Couple meters, we're talking 20 meters or so, and it's still yeah. sort of off by just it's just a little bit off each time. It's pretty yeah. good. Uh, yeah, they are very good at this. Um, and um, yeah, so this shows that this signal isn't, it's visual spatial. It's not just visual and not just spatial, right? It's visual spatial because it has to do, sorry, what's going on? So the max. Okay. Um, it cannot only be visual because. Well, well there's, there's no visual here. Well, so it is, on the left, on the right, right there isn't. So on the right, it's progressing. It has to be spatial, right? It has to be. But you see, there's discrimination between the different textures. So there is a visual component. Yeah, over there. Absolutely, but it still happens over here when you reset yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. So it's doing the same thing. But when you turn off the, when you give it uncertainty uh, about its location, it drifts. Yeah, and uh, we see this in our recordings from uh, CA one two. Where are they? Right. We didn't find any play cells in CA1 when we did the same experiment. We found these things. We found these things that seem to like ratings of different orientations, but they have these weird, much wider fields about almost like a grid. Um, you know, I, I, do the, I do this little thing, which probably a lot of experimenters would just like shudder, but um, I imagine myself being in a rat and running along this maze. And I saw, I see these patterns going down. I mean, what would I think? Mm -hmm. 
would I think that I'm in a linear track and I'm thinking how far along I am? Or am I sitting there going, oh, it's, you know, it's pattern A, pattern B, pattern A, pattern B, pattern A, pattern a done. Mm -hmm. And in this case, if you don't find place cells, it's because it might be the rat doesn't think of it as a place. The rat's just like saying, okay, I'm keeping track of work. what's coming up next. It's more like we're listening to a melody. And, and so, yeah, okay, I've got this pattern. I go, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and I have to progress the melody by running, but right. I don't mentally, my mental model isn't like I'm on this track, I'm jumping down the hallway and how far down I am. It might be easier just to imagine going, okay, we got the, the little squares, a circle, the little squares, the circles, and the little squares, now I'm done. Um, sure. And that's why I might not find play cell because it's it's all it's like the counting notes in the melody. You know what I'm saying? It could be, but it could also be that the computation it just look like these things just look like play cells. For example, this would be like the stream uh, argument. The, the they look like play cells because of the types of environments we're showing. Uh, people have found play cells. But well, you said they don't look like play cells. No, no. In, when we find play cells uh -huh. in other experiments, it's because of the how we show the the environment. And these. Uh, so in VR, in these linear one-dimensional corridors, people do find places all the time. Attila Lozanchi. Yeah, I, just, I do. I agree. But, but oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Sorry, uh, if I may. Uh, yeah, so okay. first of all, this, uh, these predictions and everything, they have to happen in a spatial context. And you, know, you do like the, the control where you basically see if it's temporal, if it's temporal, or, um, or spatial, right? And if it's temporal, if you sort of align the, um, if you align the zero here to be so if you, if you align the activity to be like after the offset of the previous grading or of the previous stimulus in general, and if it were only temporal, then they would line up, right? If you match for speed. So basically these, these peaks would coincide, right? Uh, but they don't, they spread out. So if you hear a line on previous stimulus and line in grading, right. right? And you spin traversals by faster slow. I lost you on this one. Can you sorry, okay. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just, I was, I zone out. So say it again, I'll get it the second. Right. So imagine you align uh, you align your responses either on the gradient because you know we take like a, a mean subtraction right of what's happening before and we see the evoked response right so you align it on the grading that's about to see and that would be time zero or you align it on the previous stimulus and that would be time much, minus two how much how far you travel from the previous stimulus. how much time has progressed yeah, for example, yeah right yeah and if you bend it by slow and fast reversals you would see that like for example the if it's temporal, it wouldn't matter if it's, if the traversals are slow or fast. Yeah, because, right? it's a time axis, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you align on space in fast and slow traversals, they these things overlap completely. Yeah, right. But if you align on fast and slow, if you, on the previous stimulus, there's a smear and they're temporally offset. And the difference is exactly proportional to the speed. Exactly. So it has to be spatial by that regard. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we found, and uh, this was figure one in the paper, is that neurons, visually selective neurons, for example, uh, not only recognize if you, they're looking at A or B, but they recognize where they're looking at it. Yeah. So, no, I can understand that too. But, but So some understanding of space has to be there. Well, but, but, but is in it some a conjunctive sense. cell of some sort, space and stimulus? Or it could just be like, either, yeah, yeah, that or, you know, the, the, there's enough, let's say, modulation. So you're saying I'm not only looking at A, I'm looking at A3 because I need to know what I'm looking yeah, at. Yeah, but that's like a melody. It's like I have the you know the same refrain over and over again in a melody. And I don't get yeah. you know you, you hear the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth. It repeats many times. You don't get confused every time it repeats. You know where it is in the melody. But you know that's also like a yeah. But that's also kind of like a space within. The, yeah, but I don't. It doesn't mean I have to visualize it as a space. But I I, I want to I don't want to focus on this too much. No, I just mean, point out if I look at a hallway. I walk up and down the hallway, and I see the hallway in front of me. Yeah. I have a sense where I'm in that hallway. I have a very clear sense where yeah. I'm in this whole this building right here. Mm -hmm. If I was in some sort of a, a stranger environment where these pe weird patterns would appear as I'm pretending mm -hmm. you're running on a wall, I might not visualize that there's a hallway. I might just come up with some other model in my head. Well, what the hell's going on? This is a strange right. thing and animal in. This is not a normal environment. Um, well, I mean, that's hard to control. I mean, you I know it's hard to control. Can't I can't answer that. I know, I know. But my point is, we have to. It, it, the results can be influenced by that. Absolutely, they can. Yeah. And the, the fact that it's linear, right? I mean, it would be better if this were a two-dimensional, uh, yeah. a two-dimensional virtual environment. So yeah, and I mean, literally, all the, the simplest thing you could do is like a sort of conjunction of space, of visual stimulus and time, and one dimension that's space, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I don't see another. Way I, I, I just find it, 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 we have to be careful when we interpret 
Oh, well, absolutely, right. Um, but you know, this is like all consistent with what uh, other people have shown before. I'm just trying to get. But the big thing I think we got on this pack. We we're just talking about what kind of error signals can be pr propagated. Right. And, um, and I, I think that the truth. I'm just going to stick with it at the moment. I haven't heard anything to lodge in this, but the traditional view of air prediction mm -hmm. error in the um, in the predictive coding world is I don't believe it's something that can be understood by another region. And we have the, 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 the same results can be explained by a slightly different language. Uh, right. Well, I would disagree with you, but I mean, that's still, I know, something for great. You can just spend less at least. Well, we have a, a couple projects in the lab looking at exactly yeah. that. It's but, my, my thing is basically, it's, it's more of a fundamental principle, like how could a, a, a bunch of neurons know what another bunch of neurons, the, the error be? I, my assumption is that when the brain is, the cortex is sort of built, there isn't specific knowledge. There's specific knowledge in the connectivity yeah. between them. Because that has to be determined primarily by genetics, a long range kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But what that, what that, those axons represent, how to interpret them, it can't be. This is sort of the founding assumption already. You, can't, you really can't know where it, where those signals are coming from and what they represent. Mm -hmm. It has to, it has to be a message that can be interpreted locally. My own knowledge of the world. So when you're sending me an error that you calculated an error in vision, I not necessarily can't understand what that means. I don't know what vision is. It has to be in the language of the object, the language of the Absolutely. object. Absolutely. But we see that already one, one of these projections, at least the prediction projection, is uh, probably in the local language. So there's no reason to assume that the I, I projection mean, here cannot be transformed. How did you get that? How do you know this in the local? Again, I'm not really sure we're using the same term as the local language. And again, this is not like conclusive, of course, that it's a local language, so to speak. Uh, being one being the red not to be in one, the fact that the, the, these are visual signals that are stimulus selective. Visual and predictive signals are stimulus selective. In other words, in the topic. So that just because they, just because because they come active, it's not that they're visual selective. It's what is, is every one of these signals is a, is a sparse representation of, of activity. It's not a single axon. And so, how do you interpret that sparse representation? Yes, it's going to be visually selective or visually activated. But what's its interpretation? How do I encode, how do I interpret that set of active axons at any point in time? Um, they're meaningful only, this is like a general principle of the brain, they're only meaningful from the local circuit that can generate. Once you predict a, um, you take a bunch of axons, you project them someplace elsewhere in the brain, the person receiving it has no idea what the hell they mean. Well, absolutely, right? So, but, the, but the things, these look enough like visual responses and the predictive responses. Oh, yeah, well, I. That the, you could assume that if this is uh, something that lands on the distal uh, dendrite of, uh, sorry, the epical dendrite of um, uh, pyramidal cell, like the pyramidal cell would be like, this is like the other things I get locally, right? Uh, okay. Or at least again, the, the, the sort again, of. Again, I just think when we think about. This is completely consistent with the voting idea, too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. say it's a good. So, um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's so the only other thing you need would be the symmetric thing in which like the error if it's fed forward would need to be locally computed or you know in one of the two areas it needs to be locally sort of transformed into whatever the other cortical area. Is. Yeah, that's a question is like when I think about when I've read about predictive coding and I'm not an expert. So excuse me for speaking out without knowledge. No, but no, no, no. predictive coding is the idea that I have an expectation, mm -hmm. which is some sparse activation. I have an actual sparse activation, an actual input comes in. I somehow calculate the difference, and that difference would be in the local language of the region. It would be like, uh, I need, and if I'm going to send that to someone, I have to understand how the receiving person can get meaning out of it. Not just that there was an error, but understand exactly how that receiving region can take advantage of the error that was yeah. earlier. Yeah. I just don't see that still. Maybe I'm just missing it. I mean, I think it's something that uh, is implicit in the, I think it's implicit in the theory, at least for someone who take, you know, has thought about the theory. It needs to happen, right? So um, we are looking for this. I mean, you're I, have, I, mean, this. Yeah, I mean, you could don't, you don't even have to do any neuroscience. You could just ask yourself, how could that signal be interpreted by a set of neurons? What, what are the possible mechanisms for that? Oh, okay. yeah, sure. And this is something that is like, I think a little bit under, Underdetermined, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, but as I thought about, it, I can't think of a way. So that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I can't think of one. So, right. but it seems to happen in the top-down projection. So it should be it, it, theoretically. It is. It could happen in the feed-forward projection uh, if yeah. you want to think of it that way. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another thing. And 
the last slide is uh, basically the idea that it's, uh, we shouldn't think this as a hierarchy, uh, at least not in the classical sense, because all these, you know, we find these very... I agree with that 100%. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was very happy to read that on your yeah, um, yeah. thousand brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then again, it's, it's symmetric, right? Both areas send prediction errors and predictions to each other, um, which would need to happen for, for this, this whole thing to work. Yeah. But that's like our voting signal. The voting yeah. signal includes both in one signal. Absolutely, right. The question is just how explicitly is that an error and how explicitly is that a yeah. prediction in, in, in the language of the area that you're predicting yeah. to or not. That is a little bit what the disagreement is about, right? Exactly. Yeah. How much processing is done with those inter-area connections? And again, I, I, mean, I think we have to be really careful because there are inter-area connections which are a laminar, a laminar, laminar equivalent, mm -hmm. and and then there's these other ones which are more classic hierarchical, and I think they have different meanings and they have different ways of interpreting. So we have to be careful when you say top down. I can agree that V2 projecting to V1 type of thing could be yeah. much more in the line. It, it, that's going to be different than V1 projecting to S1, mm -hmm. uh, which we see. You know, we see those kind of connections. Yeah. Those connections, I argue, can't be a predictive coding. You know, like, you know, V2 to V1, maybe. I, I, you know, I can go into that. I can maybe accept that. And the other thing, we see so many things. I, I, like, uh, I personally start steering away from like thinking of V1 as a visual area and S1 as a somatosensory area, because we see all modalities in each area. Well, that's consistent with the voting because basically anybody can vote. So anybody anywhere who knows anything about the thing you're observing can inform V1, uh, like, yeah, hey, maybe you should be looking for this thing, you know. <laughs> and that's why we see uh, we see these effects of almost every modality, yeah. um, and everywhere else. Yeah. But yeah. V1 only gets no one else. You know, V1 gets input uh, sensory input from the thalamus from the eyes. Doesn't get from anywhere else. Um, I'm um, not 100% sure about that, but you know, you can get it indirectly through other Well, I can right? get it, yes, indirectly, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm not aware that V1 gets in, I don't think V1 uh, gets indirectly. Is there anybody who's done some projections, projections, projections that are not LGN into V1? And they might have, I don't fully remember, but I do remember some of them talking, it's not just LGN. Yeah. Well, no, not just LGN, but through relay neurons, I mean, I don't think V1 gets any somatosensory input, you know, there's a medial genetic nucleus and that. Is you know I don't think V one gets input from the media. Oh, probably not. But yeah. There's uh, other like um, there's other very interesting thalamic areas that project too. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going on too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, and that of course is why this simplistic model cannot be complete. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's my thank you slide. Right. Thank, thank you. That's great. Yeah, what does that picture cool. taken? Uh, somewhere in the Alps near um, in the southeast. Wait, Alps. <laughs> okay, that's good. Where are you? I'm in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you are. Yeah. These are people who help with the experiment and some of the data analysis. Did you go there to take this picture? Were you just on the <laughs> you know, I can It was a laboratory, like, and we just stopped to take a picture. I'm sorry, what? It, it was a laboratory, so we were just oh, like, we're all here on the same picture. Yeah. All right. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm stopping recording.